technology changes every day, every day, and I wish I knew more about it. But I do know about, I think I know about um, teaching and learning, and I think that it can and is a really powerful tool to get that, get that student to a better place. KVEC is the Kentucky Valley Educational Cooperative. Um, KVEC has been a public education support entity for nearly 40 years here in eastern Kentucky. KVEC works with 22 public school districts from Mason County up on the Ohio River south to Harlan County, um, around the Virginia border, Pike and Letcher, um, um, and, and then west to Wolf Lee and Owsley County. The majority of counties that KVEC serves are uh, rural in nature. They could probably be classified by higher than average poverty rate and are relatively small. Kentucky and its Department of Education has done, I think, a remarkable job trying to create the capacity for every school in the state to be able to access the internet um, in, a, in a very high speed way. Um, that's a huge financial undertaking and now the use of the internet and the data that it can be carried on there has increased so, um, so much that initially those state-of-the-art trunk lines um, are now no longer as effective as what they once were. It's just booming, you know, I mean, <laughs> technology is just booming. Even here in the library, things have changed so rapidly over the last six years, you know, just what time I've been here, it's just been amazing. And uh, the use is up and up and up and up, you know. I mean, our computers, I bet we have average of 50 people here a day using the computers. I can't recall a time that there wasn't internet at my house, so yeah. It was always the first thing to have before we went anywhere else. Uh, my dad loves it, so yeah. They didn't run internet at our house until recently, until Windstream came along. And then I've had it since I was about 12. We didn't have it when I was a little kid, though. I don't ever remember having internet. I think as my sister got older, we decided to get it for school and stuff. Kids having access to the internet is incredibly important now and will be more important in the future for their own learning and for their ability to interact with um, uh, the rest of the world. Um, and, and, and I guess the, uh, the thing that we have to look at as educators is figure out how to take that tool and use it for an education purpose rather than resist it. My name is Regina Donner and I teach here at Letcher County Central High School and I am a chemistry teacher. Everyone in our building has uh, LCD projectors, everyone has computer access, we have good broadband uh, internet here. Um, sometimes during the day it's a problem if several people are on it, we kind of tie the line up. Uh, but as far as a resource, it's the greatest resource I've got because any information I need to know, I know I'll be teaching uh, um, a chemistry class and uh, be teaching a concept and I'll, I'll not know the answer to it and I can go over there and Google it real quick and get that answer for my students. Uh, this summer I took a training through the CDC that has an online program that I plan on working with my freshman studies and it's, uh, it's an online uh, curriculum that actually has games and activities that kids do to, do, to study pathogens. I mean it's a free web-based program that, that Rice University has done. Okay, and so I'm real good at going in and answering the questions and reading the material and doing the activity, but when it came to playing the video games with it, I was lousy at it. Uh, I mean, there were several games where you had to actually, uh, like, like for instance, just this is an example, there's a game similar to what the old Frogger used to be, and you're, you are trying to p fight a pathogen. And so you're going through this uh, kind of web of things to try to get through it, and you have to land right on the thing that's not a pathogen, but something that will fight a pathogen. I'm lousy at the games. I'm good at the content. But I know when I introduce it to the kids, they're going to be good at the games. 
you know, and if, if kids can play games, because they're real good at that kind of thing, then learning will be enhanced much more so than me standing and delivering it to them. We, we need to use professional judo and exploit the inevitable. It's going to happen. I mean, they are going to use technology. We are going to use technology. It becomes the art part of being an educator to figure out how to make it work so that they are learning what they need to know in addition to what they want to know. Um, in high school, I had a teacher who, the school gave all the teachers laptops year before I came in. So she did not use her laptop for anything for the class. And it just sat there all the time. And um, there were videos and DVDs and all sorts of stuff that came because it was a Spanish class. And she refused to play any of them because she was kind of weary about using things that you had to go on the internet to use. She was an older teacher as well, so I think that might be why, but it just made the class harder to learn in. Um, it's something that I pretty much had to be drug into the 21st century. I'm of that age, it was, it was all, my learning curve was very slow on that. I'm getting better at it. And there are, there are many teachers who, are, who still don't embrace it. They find it intimidating. And, and to be honest with you, it's true of anyone. We go back to where our comfort zone is, what we're comfortable at doing. And so it was like, I have even put it in my growth plan as a teacher to implement more uh, technology into my classroom. Because I know that that's something that is advantageous. Our, our kids, that's, that's what their life is now. I mean, I'm amazed at the number. I, I'm not even good at texting. And they all text, and they all use Twitter, and they all use Facebook. and so. A good educator realizes that that's a medium by which they're communicating. And if you're going to reach them, you've got to communicate by that medium. It's surprising how many kids do have access to the Internet, but their access is often not, um, the, the connectivity is not fast enough for them to be able to do what they really are interested in and want to do. Um, some kids that we have worked with um, here in projects that we have done could not um, work on the programs that we would like for them to have worked on because their internet connectivity at home was not what it needed to be. And within the school setting, um, schools are really driven by the assessment that they're responsible for kids to take at the end of the year. And if um, what kids are doing is not directly related to improving their assessment scores. There's really not a lot of time for them to do that during the day, so they can't access those high-speed sources within the school because they have other requirements they have to pay attention to. Usually the only time we spend on the computer at school is to take regular tests, state tests, but usually it's rare to use it for school projects. If you know you're going home and know you don't have internet, then you're going to spend that extra time making sure you get all the things you need to read, making sure you get your homework and everything done before you go home that evening. There's someone there at school, they're on the internet all the time, trying to just get everything together. And then on the weekends when they go home, you don't hear from them again, because they also don't have cell phones. I think with times being as hard as it is right now, you know that a lot of people that's it, when you do cut back, you know, that's one of the first things that you're going to cut back on is the use of the internet. So having it available here at the library is a big plus for a lot of families. It becomes an issue of expense and there are some families who do make the decision that that's an important part, it's an important learning tool. We're going to take that out of our budget just like we would any expense for school. Um, and there are some folk who just don't have the money. During the day, we have a lot of college students that come in here. Uh, some of them will bring their laptops and they'll sit up at a table and use their own laptops, um, you know, between classes and stuff like that and do their homework. Um, and some of them will come in and, and they'll ask for help, <laughs> you know. And uh, um, so even while the school day, the traditional school day is going on, we still have, have students in here using it. And then, Lord, when the bus runs, we're... <laughs> To we're flooded. We are flooded with kids, <laughs> and yeah, they're doing homework because you know the teachers are going to give them assignments. They have to go look up such and such, and you know they and 
it's a requirement they have at least two internet sources, much yeah. less books. One area that we worked with, um, we were really having difficulty and we continued to work with the cable provider and they said we have a three megabyte download. It's fast, it's everything you should need. And the specs on the programs that we were working on, it should have worked. Um, what we ended up finding, and I don't know why it took so long, it was a three megabyte download but a 256K upload. And part of the, pro part of the, the program's need is to send information two ways. So even though they were able to get it, they, they could receive information, the program would time itself out because it would take too long to upload. And you know, that, that became a pretty interesting argument for us because again, it put our population and our kids in the realm of being a passive recipient and not being actively engaged in the learning process. They could view a lot of stuff, but they couldn't interact and that's where we really want to get them to. Um, whether it be in a virtual world where they create a learning environment all their own, uh, whether they're participating in a blog, um, whether they're interacting with other teens on a, a problem that they want to share, um, we want them to be interactive. Having access to the internet in a, in a viable way is incredibly important to every rural area because it can bring us or we can find what we need to know. We can um, enroll in college coursework, we can enroll in graduate coursework, um, and if we choose to, we can figure out a way to use the internet for, um, for our livelihood. Most students who are very bright here want to go away and become doctors or pharmacists because they see that as the only avenue for them to make good money, you know, if it's not in the coal mines. So those bright students think, oh, I'm going to go make a doctor or a um, pharmacist. I try to encourage them to think outside of that. And the reason they do it is they want to make good money and they want to come back home. They want to live here. And there is every bit of opportunity for you to do technology-based uh, occupation and stay here. I have a friend, for an instance, that lives in Gettys and that lives in Greensboro, North Carolina, and he works for uh, the Cleveland Clinic. He does all. He's he, he's a math mathematician. He does all their uh, data analysis from his home on a computer that that returns to the research they're doing at Cleveland, and he doesn't live in Cleveland. So I tell my students, you can live right here and make good money, but and because of technology and have that opportunity. I think the that the possibility exists that if we are not capable of accessing the resources found on the internet at the same level um, as other parts of the state, then that could be detrimental to our development as a region and our young people's development individually. We need to have the capacity for our kids to access that world um, as much as kids in any other part of the country. Thank you.